Hello, and thank you for joining the Pituitary Network Association's webinar program, which is brought to you through the support of our sponsors and expert contributors. The PNA is dedicated to educating people with pituitary disorders, their families, and their health care providers. The PNA is a nonprofit organization that relies on the support from our members and donors. During the webinar, feel free to type in your questions at any time. Please note that all questions will be saved until the end of the webinar. We have a lot of time to answer as many questions as possible. Um, today's webinar, Does the Extent of Resection Matter in Pituitary Surgery, is being presented by Dr. Jamie Van Gompel and Dr. Garrett Chobie. Dr. Van Gompel is an Associate Professor in Neurosurgery and Otolaryngology, specializing in endoscopic open skull base at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. He completed his undergraduate medical school training at the University of Wisconsin at Madison. He has worked at the NIH, as well as completed a Howard Hughes Fellowship studying neuroendocrine tumors. His neurosurgical training was undertaken at the Mayo Clinic, and he went on to complete a complex cranial fellowship under the tutelage of Dr. Henry Van Lovern at the University of South Florida. Currently, he is the Education Vice Chair, Program Director of the Neurosurgery Program, and Associate Program Director of the Skull Base Oncology Program. Further, he manages a busy skull base oncology and pituitary practice, in addition to performing research with active NIH UNR funding. He has authored over 150 publications, of which over 30 are pertinent to pituitary pathologies and endoscopic surgery. Dr. Garrett Chobie is a fellowship-trained rhinologist and endoscopic skull-based surgeon practicing at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. He completed his residency training at the University of Pittsburgh and his fellowship training at Stanford University. Dr. Chubby works closely with his neurosurgical partners to treat a variety of pituitary and cranial-based tumors. His primary research interests include improving oncologic and quality of life outcomes for patients undergoing endonasal tumor resection and tailoring individualized treatment for patients with chronic rhino sinusitis. And we are going to turn it over to them. There's going to be a brief delay as we switch presenters. Okay, you should see on your end to accept. Okay, I see your screen. Just let me go, let me know we can go, Tammy. Okay, I can see your screen and you are ready to go. Is it possible to get the uh the thing on the right side brought down? Yes, there's a little orange arrow. You can click that and it'll move out of your way. It's at the top. Oh, oh perfect. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Well, thank you, Tammy, and uh, thank you to the, the Pituitary uh, Network Association for the opportunity to be able to, um, to talk to the patients. Uh, and I, I really am uh, an admirer of this, of this series because, um, you know, I was in, in preparation for this watch the, uh, like I think, greater than 25 videos of just spectacular content that's been generated over time. In fact, it was very difficult to find a, a subject matter that uh, was not discussed before, and I just applaud the, the efforts for such a complete uh, database of, um, of uh, pituitary knowledge available to, the, to those members of the association. And again, um, uh, happy that we're able to participate in such a great project. Um, with, uh, with that, I will say that uh, uh, I wanted to present some research that we've done over the years uh, looking at the extent of resection uh, and does it matter in pituitary surgery. And um, we're coming to you from the Mayo Clinic in the Great White North. Uh, very cold, we're, we're thawing out up here, so it's, uh, I've had a lot of time to think about and, and put some time into this talk. And I'm very appreciative as, as all things at the Mayo Clinic are done in, 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 in teams of uh, having my uh, my close friend and colleague uh, Dr. Choby talk to talk to those uh, that are listening in today about uh, what uh, what to expect for post-operative nasal care is I it, I didn't see a lot of information on the PNA web uh, um, webinars about that and I think it will be very useful for um, uh, for those that are tuning in today. Uh, I do have some disclosures, uh, only one of which is rel is uh, important to the talk that I'm going to give today. Um, my uh, stock and company ownership is an, is an epilepsy-related uh, research, and the, uh, my Medtronic works are, are also with 
with Brain Machine Interface. Uh, the, there is a, we have had a stores educational grant um, uh, provided to us in the past as, pro, as a program director, but um, that shouldn't uh, uh, interfere with anything in their talk, and I'm not going to talk about anything off-label today. So the, the basic question is, does extent of resection matter? And uh, for those of you that have seen this before, this is Captain Obvious. Uh, and you know, of course, uh, extent of the resection matters. And, and realistically, unlike a lot of other tumors that we deal with, um, how much is a very pertinent question in, the, in this benign uh, disease. And obviously, some extent of resection matters because why would we take anybody to the operative theater otherwise? Um, and this is a, a classic example of, uh, in fact, one of the first patients that I treated at the Mayo Clinic about uh, seven years ago, uh, which a 59-year-old woman uh, presented with uh, severe vision loss, as you can see up here in the right-hand corner where there is so these black spots correspond to areas this person couldn't see, and underwent an MRI and some um, lab uh, uh, analysis that she had a, a fairly normal pituitary function with uh, not an elevated prolactin, which is very important for some of these tumors, as some of these can be treated by medications. So she comes in the clinic with a very large tumor that, um, as you can see, this white area around the skull base that I'm outlining with my mouse, and also eroded into the bone around the skull base here that pushed up the optic chiasm and was impeding her vision. The problem is with this tumor is that I don't think there's a place on earth anybody could go, and not even the Mayo Clinic, to have it all completely removed. And you can go to multiple meetings across the country, and we can, we can wax endlessly about what is the critical portions of this operation. Now, going into this tumor and removing just the part up towards the optic chiasm, in some capacities, is probably the goal that most people would agree on, or doing several operations to do that. But realistically, I think it matters to try to take out as much of the tumor as we safely can without injuring the patient. Um, and again, those goals are vision, take out uh, everything, again, is really impossible, and obviously not causing a new problem with the surgery. The patient only came in with some vision problems, um, good pituitary function, uh, and uh, we want her to leave the operation in that state. So we take her to, the, we take her to surgery and, and do as good of a job as we can, and it's true that in some of these patients, even with these large abnormalities, we can prevent them from getting radiation in the future and doing quite well. But this is, again, a point of contention across the country and something that I'd just like to bring some light to in this PNA series. So the way that we just define extent of resection, um, or that's how much of the tumor is removed, is once in a, a blue moon, we're able to do and block resections. And one could consider this in, in some of the nice uh, uh, cases that we saw, especially by Dr. Lonzer, about this extra capsular resection with very small pituitary tumors. We strive to do this in which we don't even see the tumor. We stay around a pseudo capsule and remove the tumor. Gross total resection is where we think we've removed all the tumor and that's confirmed on the post-operative MRI, but as, as a lot of the patients that have had previous surgery understand, after we do surgery, sometimes the imaging of the, the pituitary and, and where the tumor was is kind of complicated. And then there's subtotal resections in which we see there's uh, visible remnants. And that's mostly what we're talking about today in which we know we're going to leave some tumor behind. Is there an adequate amount or what should, should we strive to get a certain amount of tumor out? So I believe it's important to achieve a, a, a good resection or a complete resection within reason for all adenomas. Um, and in functional tumors, I think it's even more important. So those are tumors that are secreting something that's affecting the body. But I don't think we should remove these all at all costs. Um, and it's critical to achieve the best resection relative to morbidity. And I always think about Sun Tzu's uh, comment about he who wishes to fight must first count the costs when I think about these tumors in that we need to understand that the main goal is to make the patient better in these cases, and the main goal is not to hurt them. But if we have techniques and abilities to take out all the tumors safely, we should do that. In non-functioning tumors, as described uh, above, historically, we just treated these to alleviate symptoms, such as vision loss. And the extent of uh, resection was considered less important due to the fact that these are benign tumors, so you could go back to surgery or Alternatively, um, the radiation is very good at treating these tumors. Uh, sorry, that's that last patient. She did well with vision too postoperatively. 
Um, so the things that have been reported to increase the extent of resection, uh, it's becoming more and more clear that endoscopic approach, at least within a single surgical setting, ha probably has some advantages of, over the microscopic approach for tumors, especially greater than two centimeters in their completeness of resection. We'll go over a little bit of that data. Not having cavernous sinus invasion is also something that leads to an improvement in, in uh, and complete resection. And you'll hear a term, uh, and you'll see a little slide about this later, where we grade this by nospina grading, but effectively that just tells us how much of the cavernous sinus where that carotid artery and some of the nerves live, how much of that is involved. In, and, and in some cases, as the tumor I showed before, there's complete involvement in taking out the cold tumor is not something that can be achieved. Tumor consistency is very important uh, for these cases. Uh, most of the pituitary tumors are very soft, but once in a blue moon, we'll encounter a firm tumor, which really limits oftentimes the, resec the resection for a variety of reasons, but we'll talk about some strategies uh, uh, regarding that later. And, uh, and obviously tumors that need a complete resection are more often com completely resected, which are those functioning adenomas, Cushing's tumors, growth hormone tumors, uh, thyroid secreting, uh, thyroid hormone secreting tumors, and, um, uh, and uh, medically resistant prolactinomas. And there's a question, uh, there's, there is good data that if we use intraoperative MRI, uh, that this will improve the chance of a postoperative, uh, of a better resection. The question, however, is if we use it on every case, uh, is it cost effective? And it certainly extends the, the, uh, the case. And it's uh, probably not useful in all cases, but certainly uh, selectively should be used in, in complicated tumors. And although there's not a lot of data out there about this, um, I add this uh, again, uh, representing uh, here, I'm here with Dr. Troby again, that probably a collaborative or teamwork surgery does lead to a better resection is there's two surgeons in the operating room seeing the case and understanding what the tumor looks like and can say, hey, is that a little bit of tumor? Take that out. I, th I think the teamwork approach certainly improves uh, a patient's um, extent of resection. This is a study that was uh, done down Miami, which looked at the post, pre and post uh, volumes in patients that underwent uh, pituitary adenoma resection amongst one surgeon, Dr. Doc Marcos. Um, in this single surgeon series, there was uh, uh, 154 patients treated. Microsurgery was done in, or micro, uh, microsurgery was done in 37 patients. The endoscopic approach was utilized in 117. And what they noticed was that there was a higher incidence of complete resection in a mean reduction in volume in the endoscopic uh, cohort, although they did not see a significance in this when they used all tumors. The recurrence rates that they observed were significantly lower in the endoscopic group, but however, one could uh, potentially point to um, a surgeon experience in this as the endoscopic uh, cases were done later in the series. And the, end, the subgroup analysis identified that patients with preoperative tumor volume is greater than one millimeter uh, or one centimeter were less likely to recur through the endoscopic approach. And we'll get to some data that may support that. The postoperative complications did not vary significantly between these two groups. In the current literature, it, there is more and more data appearing that endoscopic surgery results in a greater extent of resection and microscopic tumors, especially for tumors that are greater than one centimeter. And uh, just as one example in the bottom of this page or this slide, um, there was a series that just came out in 2018 in which there were tumors all greater than three centimeters, so very large pituitary tumors. The average size for the endoscopic core was 3.6 centimeters and the average size for the microscopic core was 3.4 centimeters. And if they looked at postoperative tumor volumes, after surgery in six months, the endoscopic group had on average 4.6 millimeters left while the uh, microscopic group had 17.7 uh, millimeters left. And the gross total resections were observed more commonly in the endoscopic group at 81% in the microscopic group at 16%. And again, does this degree of resection matter in non-functioning tumors? So we see that there's, a, that there's an increase in extent of resection, but does it really matter? Well, the question becomes pertinent, especially in neurosurgery. Now, this is, a, this is not pituitary adenomas, but within, uh, in neurosurgery, uh, we treat another disease that slowly progresses, although this is a fatal disease uh, called gliomas. This is a glioblastoma uh, data that at one point in time, people believe that the extent of resection did not impact the outcome. And through careful recording over time, they discovered that it 
when in fact, and there's been data since this that shows every percentage of resection that you can improve without hurting the patients, that, that does impact the patient's long-term outcomes. Um, unfortunately, when we look at endoscopic surgery versus uh, microscopic surgery, it's just that the endoscopic surgery hasn't been around long enough to understand in these cohorts if there's enough follow-up uh, to show that there's a substantial difference between microscopic and endoscopic surgery. And in fact, uh, there's a good uh, multi-center group, unfortunately we're not a part of that currently, that's looking at microscopic and endoscopic resection. And I think this will be um, understood better in a decade, but right now we don't understand it. The first Endoscopic approaches were reported in 1995. I know this is a very dense slide. And then the first case series was in 1997 out of, out of Pittsburgh. And it's just that at this point in time, it does not appear as though there's enough data to, comp to compare the two. Now, there are meta-analyses that are difficult to interpret too. Um, so what we did with our cohort is that we took patients that all had microscopic surgery um, in, uh, in, a, in a decades age range, so 1998 to 2008, we took all patients with non-functioning adenomas greater than two centimeters and with well-defined pre-op and post-operative volumes on MRI. And unfortunately, back in this time, it, um, a lot of the, the images get lost over time. Uh, but we um, had at least a decade to, to understand if they needed another treatment. And our outcome measures for this were repeat surgery and radiation. And again, getting at the surrogate does extend a resection matter in a non-functioning adenoma or a larger tumor. Um, when we looked at the two groups, uh, we looked at multiple factors. And in this particular slide, in 78 patients, there was a group that did not grow over the appropriate follow-up time and a, and a group that did grow. It turned out that older patients had less likelihood of having their tumor grow over time. Um, those with or cavernous sinus in, uh, invasion seemed to have more common growth over that time, although that did not bear out in multivariate analysis. And it looked like there was a substantial difference in the extent of resection in which those patients received that did not have growth. And of course, in this group, when we looked at those with growth total resection, there was less chance of a, a recurrence in that, in that circumstance. When we looked at this more in a more detailed manner with multivariate analysis, it turned out that age, so being older had less chance of recurrence and extent of resection were the only things that mattered in um, the, uh, the lack of a secondary treatment for this. When we looked at the data linearly, it appeared as though there was a, a threshold, although you can do this with a lot of data, of at least an 86% resection threshold being the, the potential um, threshold in which one needs to achieve to prevent a potential second uh, operation or radiation therapy for the patients. So our conclusion from the study was that extent of resection does matter uh, to prevent another therapy, but what we did not look at in the study is if the complications went up from increased resection, are you worse off? And I think the answer to that is yes. Um, so you should only take what you safely can. And the impact of the second treatment on, on, um, on, on the patient, so radiation or second surgery side effects, uh, which this, uh, this core was not set up to look at. And finally, I just want to emphasize these tumors are benign tumors. All of these strategies lead to good quality of life long term. And that is what we're up against, that we want patients to get back and be normal the best that they can. Um, this is a case in which I, I just want to prove the point that invasion matters. This, this is a young lady that had a growth hormone secreting tumor, you know, a very large tumor in which we, she underwent three surgeries because it was a functioning tumor to get her down to a very small residual in which we knew we couldn't remove part of the tumor, this part that's wrapped around the carotid artery. And still to this day, after even radiation now, after proton beam therapy, she still has probably positive disease here. And unfortunately, this extent of resection resulted in her uh, not needing a secondary medication to control her, her uh, disease. And what this slide represents is different grading systems that have that have shown and to emphasize over time that when surgeons talk to each other, what I think indirectly we all recognize that some things do matter in terms of how we can, how we sometimes cannot take out all the tumor. 
And this is that common NOS classification system or NOS Steiner classification system. And what you look at is here's a tumor that's completely within the pituitary gland and should in most circumstances be removed completely. And these are varying degrees of involvement of the area in which the carotid artery and the, and the nerves uh, live. And in those that there's complete encasement, we, we know that we cannot, even though we can sometimes take out all the visible disease, oftentimes there's still disease in the areas that we're touching around the nerve. Um, for smaller tumors, uh, finding it really does aid the extent of resection. And we see this time and time again, and I, I, I want to applaud Dr. Lonzer's um, excellent uh, uh, talk about uh, uh, Cushing disease and that really, if we know where the tumor is, we have such a higher chance of curing the patient. And, and, and there are things, so Mayo Clinic currently has the, uh, the only um, uh, approved uh, for clinical use 7T MRI in the United States. And this has already made an impact in our ability to treat some of these patients in which they come through with MR negative disease. And we see the tumor on the follow-up imaging and they give us a lot more confidence and ability to first remove the whole tumor. But on top of that, limit the amount of impact to our surgeries on the patient's pituitary gland or even cause a secondary CSF leak. We do um, <clears throat> believe also that tumor uh, stiffness or firmness affects the extent of resection. And what's, uh, you know, we use these weird terms all the time about stiffness or firmness of the tumor, but, you know, it's true that most adenomas are soft like jello or cream of wheat and that we'll go in with uh, two suctions or sometimes curettes and suctions and just be able to suck most of these tumors out. And it gives us a great ability to tell the difference between that and the pituitary gland, which is commonly more, uh, more firm and, and it gives us this textural difference. But there are about 5% of, of uh, patients that have stiff or fibrous tumors. Now, when they're small tumors in, in the pituitary gland, it's not a big deal. But when they're larger tumors, they're, they become very difficult to remove and they give us less confidence uh, when we're taking them out. There are some techniques that may allow us to understand that before the operation to first talk about the risks, but also prepare for a more difficult operation in, in which we need to spend more time and be more detail oriented. One technique is a technique that, um, that uses a non-invasive technique called uh, MR and that most of the patients that have looked at, uh, that are watching this are familiar with, but it adds one thing. It shakes the head a little bit. And if we see something that's in this depiction, this, these are the firm areas and the, and the whitish areas, soft areas, and we send those waves through them, it turns out that the firm things don't shake as much as the soft things. And we can see augmentation of those waves and we can use that information to tell us what's firm in a soft area and sometimes if everything's firm. Now, this is clinically used already in, uh, in liver disease, and people can take the same technique with an MRI, send ultrasound into the liver, and we can find out how bad their liver is or how firm it is, because it turns out if you have um, liver disease over time, it gets replaced with this fibrous tissue. Here's an example of what that brain um, uh, driver looks like. So your head goes in here just like any other MRI. It's in the coil, and it, it shakes your head a little bit. And the way we first described this is within uh, with these other tumors that are also benign called meningiomas. So in this particular patient, there's a large tumor pressing on the brain right here. And if we put them in this system, and these are these are just various tumors, we see that they're either firm, as we see up here, or a soft tumor, and that gives us a, a, a different degree of, uh, I think, estimated complications, and also gives us uh, the ability to. Um, really understand the surgery more thoroughly preoperatively. When we looked at all of our meningiomas, it really co correlated with, our, with what we thought the stiffness was at surgery and what the stiffness was predicted by the MRE. And here are some other examples of those tumors. So a large um, meningioma in the back of the head predicted to be firm, and it was found to be so at surgery. Now, the question was, could we apply this to pituitary uh, adenomas and what the use utility would be? And sure enough, um, we used this on initially a couple larger uh, pituitary adenomas. Now, we'd expect in most circumstances, you, despite a little bit of cavernous sinus uh, invasion, you're to remove most of this tumor, and it turns out that it's soft. So we'd predict with a high level of confidence that we'd have over 90% of the tumor out here. Um, same thing in this circumstance. Again, there's lack of redness here or this on the stiffness kilopascal scale no evidence of tumor where we believe the tumor would be sitting and uh in turn i found this tumor to be very 
um, soft, another tumor in which we found the same uh, at the time of surgery, which helped us to manage the disease quite well. Now, this was very interesting. So this is a patient with, was referred with a um, um, large pituitary adenoma, at least it was reported that, and we did this MRE and turned out that it told us it was very firm. We went to surgery and it turned out that the patient had a distant history of a different type of cancer, and this turned out to be a cancer metastatic to the gland, and, uh, and um, we were able to manage a lot of the tumor. In fact, ended up getting a 99% resection on this. I think a lot of it preparing for the fact that the tumor would be firm and uh, being ready to handle at the time of surgery. Now, we've also done this in some other diseases, which again are not pertinent to uh, pituitary tumors, but it is uh, towards the end of this, so bear with me, uh, in that we've taken some tumors and we shake them, and it turns out that we can understand if we shake them that one thing shakes faster than another, and we can look at that interface and find out if they're stuck to something, okay? And, and the way we started doing this is with, with vestibular schwannoma, another benign tumor, in which when we looked at how things shifted well uh, relative to one another or the slip interface, we could see this nice area in which, well, this tumor we would predict is gonna be able to come off without very little brain invasion. And uh, over time with the vestibular schwannomas, we began to understand that we can predict actually in cases in which that, that rind is lost, that there's gonna be a higher degree or chance that there's a complication from surgery. Um, in, uh, in the, with, uh, with pituitary disease, we're taking this data now and we're trying to find out you know, in some patients, the tumor stays attached to the optic chiasm and, and how hard we should work to take uh, to try to remove that from the optic chiasm. So we're using that there as well as try to understand if it's actually invading the cavernous sinus. So getting back to that now spinal grading system. So my conclusions uh, for this talk are that the, that the extensive resection is important in functioning pituitary tumors and likely in non-functioning tumors. Some things may impact the extent of resection such as surgeon and team experience, endoscopic surgery, and due to advanced imaging techniques. And uh, I will hand this over to uh, my uh, my excellent colleague, Dr. Choby. All right, we'll pull up the second of the PowerPoints here. Uh, special thank you to uh, my good friend and uh, surgical partner here, Dr. Van Gumpel, for including me, as well as the Pituitary Network for uh, giving us the opportunity to speak with you today. We thought that uh, discussing post-operative nasal care for pituitary surgery would be a, a nice piece of information for our patients uh, to understand fully. So that's what I'll be discussing today. Pituitary surgery and the use of the nose as a corridor to get there has a long and storied history, as you can see here. As Dr. Van Gumbel mentioned, it really wasn't until the 1990s that an endoscopic transphenoidal approach was used where we were really utilizing the nasal corridor with endoscopes to access uh, this area of the pituitary gland which lives above the sphenoid uh, sinus. It should also be recognized that we do a lot of other endoscopic skull base surgery besides just uh, pituitary surgery. This requires a team approach from both the otolaryngologist as well as the neurosurgeon and in, in the ideal situation, really a team-based approach where we're both in the operating room together, visualizing these tumors and resecting and reconstructing the skull base afterwards together as a team. It should also be recognized that this takes a large amount of support, both from an institutional standpoint, as well as from our individual departments. And we are really lucky here at the Mayo Clinic where we have excellent support uh, on both ends in that regard. In addition, uh, we've been uh, very lucky to have uh, excellent scheduling where we can coordinate uh, clinics and operating room time, so we have really a nice crossover for these cases. I'm showing this picture to show how the nasal corridor can be a nice direct access for these tumors. This is a, an MRI scan showing a pituitary tumor right here in the cella, which is above the sphenoid sinus, which lives here. And we utilize this anatomy to allow us to go directly through the nose, open up the sphenoid sinus, and access this tumor through that area. And the nasal endoscope has been an excellent resource for that to allow uh, uh, us to bring that visualization directly to the site of the tumor. There are a number of preoperative imaging studies which are important to understand ahead of time. 
Uh, we like to look at the nasal anatomy to determine how difficult the access will be for a given case. In this particular CT scan, as you can see here, the nasal septum is quite deviated over to the patient's left side, and that will require us straightening the nasal septum in order to get access more posteriorly in the nose. In addition, the way the sphenoid sinus develops is also very important. What you'll see here is a septation through this area, which connects directly to the carotid artery which lives here. That's important for us to know about ahead of time so we can work very carefully as we open this area to gain access to the pituitary gland without creating injury to important stru structures such as the carotid artery. In addition, we like to really understand how the sphenoid sinus has developed. You can see in these images, this is a, a poorly pneumatized sphenoid sinus, which would require a lot of bone to be removed to access the pituitary gland, as opposed to this one over here in uh, figure B, as you can see, where it's a nice, well pneumatized sphenoid sinus, which makes access easier to the pituitary gland here. This is a, a picture of a case of Dr. Van Gumpel and myself after the nose has been opened and the sphenoid sinus has been opened. And there, now we're looking directly onto what we call the cella. And the pituitary gland lives directly behind this bone here. And this is both sphenoid sinuses being opened completely. So you can see this nice access that we have here. You can see another example here of some more well-defined anatomy. This is the carotid artery that lives right here. The optic nerve, which gives you vision, lives right here. And here's that pituitary gland living right here, uh, right between these as if they're goalposts, uh, it's this tumor. Here is uh, one of Dr. Van Gumbel's and myself's cases where we're accessing uh, the pituitary gland. What you'll see here is the nice advantage of having this endoscope where I'm holding the endoscope here. Dr. Van Gumpel is working at drilling some of these septations down, and you can see the excellent visualization that we have here in this particular case. This video doesn't want to play for us, um, but this is also demonstrating the ability of us to uh, very gently open the dura overlying the gland, which is the covering around the gland, and carefully uh, dissecting through there with uh, microscopic technique as we open into the pituitary gland access of a particular tumor. Many patients ask us, well, what should I expect after surgery? You guys are removing a tumor of my skull base through my nose. How long do I stay in the hospital for, and how does that affect my nose after surgery? Typically, for most cases here, the average hospital stay is approximately one to two days, assuming the patient does well after surgery. Most patients do experience a um, mild to moderate headache after surgery. And there is some nasal drainage. Typically, this is blood tinged uh, and may last for a few days after surgery as the nose continues to heal from the surgery performed. In addition, there is uh, brain fluid or cerebral spinal fluid that surrounds both the brain cavity and is in close proximity to the pituitary gland. We typically will monitor the patient uh, to make sure they don't have development of a spinal fluid leak after surgery while they're in the hospital. In addition, we generally speaking do not pack the nose any longer, so no gauze packing needs to be removed after surgery, and patients can still uh, breathe through the nose after surgery. They certainly experience some congestion, but it's uh, not to the extent where they can't breathe through their nose. After discharge from the hospital, uh, we typically recommend that you have some sort of moisturization regimen for the nose. That may consist of nasal saline sprays, which is essentially salt water, or in some cases even rinses. This helps to rinse away uh, blood clot and debris from the surgery and allow for better healing of the tissue. In addition, I usually recommend patients to come back to see me after surgery, if they're able to, to perform some cleanings of the nose, which we refer to as debridements. That allows us to ensure there's no scarring in the nose and remove additional blood clot and debris to allow the patient to heal well and have excellent breathing after surgery. One question that frequently comes up is how patients' sense of smell may be affected from surgery like this. Um, we've studied that here at the Mayo Clinic as well as, as well as a number of other centers. And most commonly, from a long-term perspective, we don't think that there is any significant detriment in smell after surgery. Most folks do experience a temporary sense of smell loss due to the swelling after surgery and the uh, congestion that they feel. This typically resolves within one to three months after surgery. Uh, we recently published a nice prospective study here demonstrating similar results. We have another uh, paper in press right now uh, that shows those same findings where there's a temporary diminished sense of smell, but it usually recovers within a few months after surgery and seems to normalize long term.
in many cases, we may need to repair a spinal fluid leak with tissue from inside the nose. This is a picture demonstrating the normal nasal septum, which is the wall that divides those in half. And frequently, we may borrow tissue from this, as you can see in this uh, photograph down here, where we'll rotate that and cover over the area of tumor resection to close off or seal a spinal fluid leak after surgery. In cases where we need to borrow tissue like this, we call that a nasal septal flap. That usually um, exposes you to some nasal crusting, which can go on for a few weeks after surgery. And in some rare cases, may even develop a perforation or a small hole in nasal septum if things don't heal quite well. We think that moisturization, as I mentioned earlier, as well as those post-operative cleanings or debridements uh, may frequently help. In Dr. Van Gumbel and myself's practices, we very rarely use lumbar drains, even if we encounter a spinal fluid leak during surgery, and we tend to uh, repair those intraoperatively, either with abdominal fat grafts or with tissue from inside the nose, like I mentioned earlier. This is a post-operative image of a patient after they've had pituitary tumor surgery, and you can see that we've put a nice nasal septal flap over this. This is about two months after surgery. And you can see how that area heals very nicely after tumor resection. Uh, with uh, what we call remucosalization or the normal lining or skin of the nose reforming over that area uh, once the patient heals from surgery. If you may have obstructive sleep apnea or use a CPAP machine prior to surgery, you should certainly discuss that with your surgeon as far as when you may restart that after surgery. In cases where we're doing pituitary surgery, we frequently will limit that for a week or two afterwards to allow the area to heal and ensure that we're not pushing any air into the intracranial space after surgery. Nasal breathing is frequently uh, improved after surgery, especially if we have to straighten that nasal septum to get access. I do usually tell patients to avoid blowing their nose for a few days to prevent postoperative uh, nosebleeds. There's been a number of studies that have demonstrated that uh, nasal airflow typically normalizes or may improve postoperatively. And again, that may temporarily be diminished from the swelling of surgery but looking at a few months after surgery, most patients report normal or even improved uh, nasal airflow uh, afterwards. In summary, as far as nasal care following pituitary surgery, I would stress the importance of having surgery at a team where the neurosurgical team and the otolaryngology or ENT team work very closely together. I think that having two sets of eyes and four hands working at the same time really gives you the optimal outcome. The nasal corridor provides an excellent access to the pituitary gland. And although you may have some temporary congestion or diminished sense of smell afterwards, those things tend to normalize after a few months, and you have the opportunity for long-term excellent sinonasal function following uh, this kind of surgery. Again, Dr. Van Gumbel and I would like to uh, thank uh, the Pituitary uh, Network for inviting us here today. And our uh, contact information is included here. And anyone who's listening today that would like to have additional questions after the Q&A session, uh, maybe feel free to reach out to us uh, afterwards. And I think we'll turn it back over to Tammy to field any questions that may be coming through uh, from the webinar. Thank you so much. That was excellent. Uh, we do have some questions. Uh, first question is, can the soft versus stiff, stiffer tumors be detected on MRI? There is uh, information that you can indirectly use. Um, so there are some papers out there about the T2, which is one of the sequences that 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 uh, that is commonly used for a diagnostic imaging. That if it's very bright on that, it may suggest that it's a soft tumor. Um, there's a nice study, I believe, by Dr. Zada at UCSC about that. Um, and I think there's some things that you can indirectly look at and, and get an impression. But there's certainly tumors that surprise you still. And I think if you talk to a number of um, experienced pituitary surgeons out there, um, they all believe that, you know, that there's certainly that 5% that oftentimes kind of sneaks up on you. I don't, I don't think anything's reliable right now. Okay, thank you. Uh, my second surgery for a non-functioning macroadenoma was endoscopic. The worst part of the experience was the catheter I had to have in place for three days after surgery. The surgeon <laughs> insisted that it was necessary. Is that really the case? My first resection was microscopic and no catheter was used. So I, I did not know what catheter they used, but I suspect it was a Foley catheter. There was a short period of time in which uh, a lot of people were using 
those we've I've never been in a in a scenario in which I've used the cat the if, if it's a nose catheter I don't, maybe they're talking about a Foley catheter in their in their um in, in their bottom but uh, but the um the the nose catheters it was found that I you know they tend to compress too much on the surgical site um, they tend to cause problems themselves and they're very uncomfortable I think uh, in general at least our practices. In a lot of practices, have moved away from packing and found it to be unnecessary. And actually, one of the most miserable parts of the experience is the nose packing. Um, I'm having a hard time hearing you a little bit. You're muffled. Can you hear it any better now? Yes, yes, that's better. Okay, perfect. So can, can you repeat that part of that? Yeah. I would echo Dr. Van Gumbel's comments. In, in our current practice, we very rarely what we refer what we refer to as non-medical packing. That would include things like Foley catheter or what we call nasal sponges. We rarely use those, and we've gone mostly to what we call absorbable packing, which really stays high in nasal cavity of a tumor site and tends to not impede a nasal breathing afterwards. So, very rarely do we have to resort to using things like a Foley catheter. Otherwise, uh, in the majority of cases. Okay, great. Um, three years ago, I had a pituitary tumor, 2.8 centimeter endoscopic surgery at Mayo Clinic Phoenix. I still have residual excess phlegm from nose throat that has not been resolved along with cough. Do you have any suggestions for that? That's, uh, that's a good question. What, what we've noticed is that in many kinds of pituitary surgery that we do, especially if it's what we call an extended approach, for a pituitary or cranial-based tumor, the natural lining of the nose, which has some very fine, uh, delicate cilia or hair cells, which kind of move mucus along, may not recover very well afterwards due to scarring or, or other issues. Certainly, rinsing with saline can be very helpful. Another adjunct that can be helpful is putting something like xylitol, which is a synthetic sugar, in the rinse, which may help a bit with some of that thicker post-nasal and also, you, you should also be aware that other things can also contribute to post-nasal drip or phlegm production, and that may include uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease or otherwise, which may also need uh, to be investigated. And I'll add one thing, too, and I, maybe Dr. Trobe can add that to this, is that, you know, Scottsdale is a very dry environment, and when we do end the nasal surgery, it's, it sounds like this person had probably a nasal septal flap, um, and uh, when... We go through a very dry winter up here. I wish we had as nice weather as they do down there, uh, but we're experiencing one of those right now. I would say that, so let's say someone had surgery in December. I often tell them that you need to get through a summer until your, feel, your nose really feels back to normal. For whatever reason, the humid, humid environment seems to really uh, reestablish nasal flow, and I think it's very hard to do in a desert. So I would emphasize that they that, that um, undergo more uh, nasal rinses. And I, and I know that it's not common to have them out in a delayed fashion after surgery. If they're having an issue, uh, moisturizing the nose will certainly help a lot. I said, yeah, she also commented that the tumor was firm and their surgery was 10 and a half hours. So that could have added to the complications. Okay, uh, next question. I had two surgeries for non-functioning. The first was over four centimeters and the second they thought was due to it falling from the brain where it was compressing prior. The second surgery came very close to the artery. Is technology improving in the, these tumors in a way that a dye can be used with such tumors? Also, the second surgery saw an improvement in my diabetes insipidus. Um. So there are now uh, some dyes, like in other things, that people are starting to use. So people are investigating IC green, which we use uh, very commonly inside the head. And, and up until about two years ago, the scope makers didn't have a filter for that. There's a lot of people doing, like, you know, even in my talk just now, I gave a slide about glioma surgery and extent of resection mattering. Well, that's why people are using 5-ALA in, in Europe, and now that's coming to the United States for tumors that are gliomas. And I am certain that we will use dyes in the future. Most of the time, though, for the pituitary tumors, um, it isn't that we can't take them off, off of the arteries or off of the nerves. It's just that if the capsule itself has, has shared blood supply with those, with those uh, dangerous structures, 
we've learned, uh, especially through transcranial operations, that if we take that capsule off, we oftentimes cause injury. And in those circumstances, your uh, dye isn't going to fix that. In fact, it might lead to more injury by telling us it's tumor. Very commonly, we just know that there's a higher risk based on prior, um, uh, obviously prior surgeons that have done these, but also uh, the, the case at hand and that taking out that little bit of extra really hasn't changed the patient's outcome. Um, but I think there's an awful lot of opportunity for dyes in the future, especially I would say for less experienced uh, surgeons to understand what, what more tumor can be removed. Excellent, thank you. Um, going back to that last patient, um, she actually lives in Albuquerque, uh, 6,200 feet elevation and uses a CPAP. Does that possibly have any effect on it. <laughs> yeah, it, so, it sounds like she has uh, sort of, in, in many ways, the, the poster child for uh, having some of those dryness and nasal issues. Certainly, uh, dry environments, increased elevation, as well as CPAP machines can dry out the nose. Um, I, I, would, I would encourage uh, that individual to make sure that the moisturization settings on the CPAP machine are optimized. Frequently, there is a uh, tank that has some uh, moisturization, which can be added to CPAP, which, which can be very nice. Uh, in addition to putting things like saline gels in the nose uh, prior to going to sleep at night, to really attempt to get that to dry out the nose a, a bit less if possible. Excellent. Thank you. I had surgery to remove tumor. was good for around nearly two years, but because moved, because moved, another MRI was done in another state. But ENT told that he cannot tell me if the growth was substantial because at different setting. I have symptoms that is not normal, but because of my blood work is in range, push my concern aside. I'm worried, but having a hard time to get to talk to someone. Um, it's it's. I wish we would. I wish we we would know if uh, this tumor was functioning or not because it sounds like there was blood work to check if it had um, recurred, and that wasn't true. But I will say that it sounds like the problem could be fixed by getting the, the preoperative MRI, the, the immediate postoperative MRI, and comparing that to the two-year MRI that they had done when they moved. Because as I, I mentioned a little bit in my talk, it is very difficult to interpret uh, postoperative pituitary surgery MRIs. And in fact, there's conferences in radiology that talk about this for a full day. Um, and honestly, the surgeons uh, that are experienced in doing this are probably the best people at interpreting the imaging because sometimes some of the, the fat that's put in there turns over to scar tissue. Um, sometimes, honestly, there's, there's some uh, from where the tumor makes space, there's residual dead space that can fill in with granulation tissue that's not tumors. Um, in someone that's had a, had a prior tumor resection, and if there are symptoms consistent with ongoing compression or recurrence of the, of the endocrine symptoms, those are the most convincing evidence for recurrence. It's, it sounds as though the, the, patient, uh, the patient's um, uh, uh, questions can be answered just by getting all the images together with an experienced pituitary surgeon. Did we lose you? Hello. Can you hear me now? <laughs> Your Verizon network is good. <laughs> uh, I heard that researchers were successful in creating a pituitary gland. When might they be able to implant a pituitary? Um, that so I haven't seen that research, but uh, it's probably a little bit like uh, um, and just to explain this in a little bit different way. You know, they can make uh, all the neurons that are in the spinal cord, they can grow those right now. But the problem is, you know, when you're, when you're born, you're a very small, uh, it, you know, you're very small and you grow and you stretch those, those connections, you know, from the, all the way from the top of your head down to your feet. And those connections are really difficult to replace. Same thing, even though on a smaller scale with the pituitary gland, that if we were able to replace some of the, the cells that create the hormones that go to the rest of the body. It's still critical that they live in an environment that they communicate with the blood system, so the, the veins or the, or the cavernous sinus, as we call it there. And it's actually even more critical that it's attached to the brain because the stalk, we always talk about 
that uh, that little thing that hangs down from from the brain, but that's actually the brain tells the pituitary gland what to make. So even creating a pituitary tissue doesn't necessarily mean it could be functional. Now it's very true that also if if there, the problem is that the cells are are the signals coming down and we don't know who those patients are, and if we could we could give them you know these intact factories of of uh, cells that could make some of these hormones, then maybe we could replace it in the future. I don't see any um, any short-term research, at least in the coming five to 10 years, that will get there. But, you know, science is amazing and, and it's moving so fast that I hope we do get there to a point that we can replace somebody's pituitary gland someday. Yeah, that would be incredible. Um, do you remove pituitary cysts? Uh, it depends on what type. Uh, so pituitary, so rapkies cleft cysts, I, I tell patients that walk through the door uh, that if we took everybody after they die and look at their pituitary gland, everybody has one actually. It's a developmental rest. Now, a certain proportion of them grow and they become symptomatic and need to be treated. And it turns out that uh, over time we've learned that you just opening that cyst results in that cyst recurring between 10 and 20% of the time in the future. And if we try to take out the whole cyst, it actually results in a lot of pituitary damage a lot a lot of the time. So the, our current treatment strategy for, for those types of cysts is to open them once, do a minimal approach to the pituitary gland, that, uh, and even less so than we normally do uh, in a pituitary operation to, to have very minimal side effects from that surgery. And if it recurs, going back and trying to take out the cyst wall. Now, there are other cysts that occur. So some pituitary tumors are cystic, and those should... Um, be removed to the best of the surgeon's abilities. Um, and then there's cysts obviously associated with there's arachnoid cysts that happen in there and are very uncommon and oftentimes look like Rathke's cleft cysts. Those, if we recognize those, those should not be open from below because they, re they result in a CSF leak when that occurs. And then there's cysts associated with cranial pharyngiomas and those should be treated as well. Okay, thank you. Um, have most people lost entire pituitary? My husband did and is undergoing many post-op challenges with being panhypopituitarism. Yeah, I, I mean, that's the whole point. And I think that that goes back to that Sun Tzu quote is sometimes is the, is the battle, uh, um, uh, you know, what's the cost of doing business here? Well, in most pituitary tumors, um, so most of them that come through the door are less than two centimeters, and typically the chance of actually injuring the pituitary gland is quite low, probably less than 5%. The bigger tumor, some of the ones that I showed in my presentation, it's a little trickier because even though we can preserve the pituitary gland, nature doesn't like movement or rapid movement very much. So it may have taken a decade for that tumor to grow and push the pituitary gland as high as it was. And if we go and take out all that old tumor, that pituitary gland often drops back down to where it was and sometimes lower. And I think um, I always say to patients that with those bigger tumors that there's a 10% chance that your pituitary gland doesn't survive the fall. And, um, and, and then you're in that circumstance. Now, complete uh, pituitary replacement is a, is, a, is a tough business because it's a lot of pills. Um, and I, 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 I empathize with anybody out there with it because, you know, you can't be far away from water. It, it, Heaven knows you can't you can't do a big hike across the mountain range or something like that because of you know you always have to be by your pills and then on top of that if you get sick you got to take extra steroids and you got to do what this this really important pituitary gland is doing for you and it is it's difficult especially if you're younger to do all those things. I would I would uh, echo those comments and and add a, a couple more as well. I think that Dr. Van Gumpel and I speak a lot in the operating room when we're doing surgery about doing our very best to preserve the gland and gland function. But especially when working on some of these very large tumors, it really takes, uh, you know, both sets of eyes to visualize that pituitary stalk, the other important, you know, small vessels that are feeding the gland in order to really attempt to preserve those and preserve postoperative function. And uh, I can't agree more that you, know, you really have to think to yourself, what, what are the goals of surgery in every particular case? You know, you, you want to get as much tumor out as you can, but whenever at all possible, uh, maintain that function because it, it is a bear to deal with afterwards uh, with, with again, hypopituitarism. One more thing that if we know that picking that last piece out is going to cause that pituitary dysfunction, if I know it's a non functioning tumor, I, I would leave that alone 100%. Uh, because of that reason, we can always come back, we can always do radiation. The problem with radiation is that it oftentimes results in pituitary failure as well. 
um, the radiation results in what I would call a gentler form of, of uh, pituitary failure. Okay, next question. Uh, I have a one centimeter by 8.5 by five millimeter non-functioning macroadenoma. I have high cortisol and high prolactin, no Cushing's. My endothink surgery is the next step and I cannot conceive or go through egg retrieval as the pituitary gland will double in size during pregnancy and won't be too risky. My neurosurgeon advised surgery is too risky at this stage given I have no visual symptoms. I am 36 and have not had children as yet. What do you feel is the next step for me? So th I heard the dimensions of the tumor is one centimeter by what? One centimeter by 8.5 without a, uh, clue there is it's whether it's millimeters or centimeters by five millimeters so that middle number I don't know if it's millimeter or centimeter um so it, I, I'm assuming it's that it's, uh, Sorry. It's, it's yeah um so th so first off it's it's barely a, a macroadenoma at one centimeters uh we sometimes uh observe some tumors and I, without seeing the imaging, it's very difficult to know because the other thing that, um, so the prolactin is probably a little bit elevated because it's pushing on the stalk. The cortisol being elevated is concerning. And I, if, if she doesn't have the diagnosis of Cushing's disease, that needs to be figured out. And I think that would require, a, like I work with, we have five or, or sorry, more than that. We have, I think we have five to eight um, pituitary specialists. Someone needs to weigh in on that because if you have elevated um, Cortisol, it actually has a risk um, not only to, to, to mom, but a, a baby as well. The, um, the other thing is not touching a pituitary tumor because somebody wants to get pregnant doesn't, doesn't make an awful lot of sense to me for a couple of reasons. If it, something this size, the chance of causing pituitary failure in a manner that's going to that's gonna make it so that someone needs help to become uh, pregnant is probably around 5% or less. And, um, and obviously in this circumstance, we'd be even less aggressive with the tumor, knowing that the goal of the surgery is diagnosis here, it sounds like, and decompression. But I, the other thing that I think people don't realize is that you can still become pregnant without a pituitary gland. It's just incredibly expensive. And um, so if anybody is out, out there in that manner, a, a very good endocrinologist can help you become pregnant uh, if that's the case. So. Okay, thank you. Um, and the next question is in different parts, kind of spread out. So let's see. It's, will you remove my, my cyst, please? Positive cortisol tests, not Rathke's, starts with an A, <laughs> uh, losing peripheral vision. And is having a hard time getting someone to help her. You're welcome to come visit us. Yes, I would recommend it. <laughs> Um, yeah. why, why does a surgeon choose stomach fat over nasal material for the door when nasal has the best results? Oh, well, I mean, you kind of heard it, you heard a little bit earlier uh, from, so nasal has, so using a nasal flap, it allows a higher rate of closure uh, with more confidence. But um, even in my practice, I, my, I would much prefer to make a very small incision on the belly and plug the, the area up with a little bit of fat because the Im implications are of that there's gonna be less post-operative nasal care. Um, and I, I also believe that it's just, it, it, in that circumstances, we've been doing that for so long and it works so well, and it seems to have patients recover so, you know, a little bit quicker that it makes sense. Now, I, I agree with you if, if you're, you know, if, if you value less incisions, not making a small incision on your belly makes a lot of sense and using the tissue inside your nose. But uh, maybe Dr. Chobi can, can weigh in on uh, the long-term, you know, I, again, of the morbidity of it. That's an excellent question. And uh, in our current practice, uh, we use a lot of nasal septal flaps, um, <clears throat> especially in larger cranial-based tumors that are not pituitary tumors where we're creating uh, very large holes or defects in the cranial base. We certainly use, use those in, in nearly every one of those cases. Our current practice is for pituitary tumors that have what we consider a high flow CSF leak, or there's a you know, large volume of spinal fluid coming through, we do tend to use nasal septal flaps for those cases. When it's a very low flow leak or just a weep of spinal fluid around it, we may 
lean towards using the abdominal fat graft simply because the, the recovery from that is much easier. With a nasal septal flap, there is you know, at least a four to six week long healing phase where there's uh, nasal crusting, perhaps nosebleeds, congestion, those kind of things, as that exposed cartilage of the nose needs to heal. Certainly debridements and moisturization can help with that, but it, it, it's not a, a completely benign uh, process to heal from that. Now, compared to having you know, tissue of other parts of your body, body used for this, it has lower morbidity than that, but uh, unless you really need it, we, we may lean towards the abdominal fat graft for the better ability to tolerate it for most patients in those cases where it's a very small or a low flow spinal fluid leak. Okay, thank you. I heard that radiation may cause stroke and issues, so my surgeon does not want to use it. Um, so just to preface this, I'm not a radiation oncologist, uh, but there is a, a small chance that some forms of radiation can uh, lead to the vessel closing up over time, um, which may cause stroke. It's a lot more common with malignancies, especially in the neck, uh, where they use a lot of higher doses because it hurts the vessels more. Um, the doses that are used for uh, pituitary tumors, are they're not the same dose. It's a lot less, uh, which also seems to have less of that problem. Now, if it's single session radiation or gamma knife for radiation, which is what's most commonly used, that has a very low risk to the carotids, um, to be quite honest with you. And um, I think if that's the best uh, therapy, the risk of having that carotid uh, hurt by the radiation long-term is actually quite low. Uh, but again, all these things are really, it's really important to have the tumor and patient in front of you to keep them in context. Okay. Um, I had transfloral surgery for microadenoma four years ago and was left with a sliver of pituitary, which seems to be working to some extent. I take a lot of drugs. I have Cushing's and it was not cured with surgery. MRI shows no tumor left. My cortisol level is not as high as prior to surgery, but it is still slightly above normal. What next? I live rather comfortably, but I cannot lose weight and I have anxiety and panic attacks. Um, so that's a very uh, common problem across country. Cushing's disease is very difficult to treat. Uh, like I said before, I really enjoyed Dr. Lonzer's presentation on it. I think he did a very balanced uh, discussion about it. Um, and uh, there are centers like the NIH uh, that I don't know if they any longer take um, treatment-resistant Cushing's, but we certainly see an awful lot of treatment-resistant Cushing's. And they're very complicated situations. If you're mildly elevated, very commonly medications can actually bring you into a normal level. And I think it's important, especially for cortisol, for cortisol secreting tumors, because you know that excessive um, cortisol is known to shorten one's life. So I think it's important to get it under control. Now it sounds like you've had very aggressive operations. The the ultimate treatment, um, if they can't control it would be to remove the adrenal glands in, in the belly. And it's very, it's very uncommon by my experience from patients that, that have been to other centers to hear that option. And that's a very definitive way to treat the excessive cortisol uh, secretion is obviously take out the end organ in which it's secreting it. Um, but they're very complicated discussions. It's also important that uh, to have someone, um, you know, a balanced team Take a, take a look at that, and I would recommend it's, it, it. Usually, when you're in your situation, you've seen several uh, different specialists. Uh, but I think if you haven't been to a major pituitary center, I, I would highly recommend doing it and hearing what they have to do. Even if it's out of network, it's worth your money to hear what your options are and have someone lay fresh eyes on your case. Excellent, thank you. Uh, do the fat grafts or nasal flaps fail over time and have to be redone? If so, what are the average time they last? That is an excellent question. Uh, in the vast majority of cases, if they're effective to seal it at the time of surgery, then they generally speaking do not fail later on. Uh, there can be certainly some, you know, rare exceptions where something happens, you know, months later, but that would be extremely unusual. Typically, they're going to fail in the spinal fluid leak redevelops. It's in the first few days after surgery. Uh, it'd be highly unusual for something to seal off and then reopen later on, uh, except in very unusual circumstances. Okay, thank you. Uh, with pituitary tumors, does that mean cancer? Why do some call it cancer, although it's benign? It is, so it is, it is not a cancer. 
Um, it's a benign tumor, and uh, there is a there is a small percentage of people, and it's very 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 uncommon. I can say you know the term is rare as hen's teeth that someone has a pituitary carcinoma, and the way that it's actually diagnosed is that it actually left the cella or the area where it usually lives and goes somewhere else. Um, they're very uncommon tumors, uh, and usually have been treated with other surgery before. Um, and people are kind of aware. It, it's uh, it's just very uncommon. Okay, thank you. Um, that looks like that is the end of our questions. Excellent presentation and excellent questions also and answers. Uh, we appreciate you all taking the time to join us today. And Dr. Van Gompel, Dr. Chilby, thank you so much for this excellent presentation. This concludes today's webinar. We appreciate you all being here with us. Uh, we got the chance to answer all the questions, but if you have any questions afterwards, you can always contact us. If you missed any part of this webinar, if you'd like to share it with friends or family members, it will be available on our website, www.pituitary.org, after it's edited. There's going to be a brief survey at the end. Please fill it out to help us get you what you need. And um, other webinars, like the one that Dr. Van Gompel mentioned, Dr. Lanzer's webinar about Cushing's are also available on our website. Uh, you can always reach us also at pituitary.org. Thank you for joining us and everybody enjoy the rest of your day. We're getting some thank you messages to you both. Everybody have a great day and thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you again, Tammy.